All right, so shall we get started? Everyone, this is Child and Alice in Psychiatry Grand Rounds. I hope you're all in the right place. My name is Chuan Mei Li. I'm one of the assistant professors in child psychiatry. I'm the co-chair for, the associate co-chair for the uh, Grand Rounds Committee, and I am helping to cover um, Dr. Stewart while she is away today, unfortunately. She sends her regards. Um, we have a wonderful talk today by Dr. Um, Tumani Coker on achieving equitable ADHD care for black children. And so I'm, I have the um, great privilege of introducing Dr. Coker. She is the chief of the division of general pediatrics and professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle Children's Hospital. As a general pediatrician and community engaged health services researcher, her research focuses on community partnered pediatric pediatric primary care delivery design to promote health equity and eliminate health and healthcare disparities for children and families in low income communities. Dr. Coker leads a successful and extramurally funded research program with a focus on community engaged design, adaptation, testing and dissemination of preventative care delivery models. She is a former and founding research director of the Health Equity Research Program at Seattle Children's Center for Diversity and Health Equity and serves as the co-director of the University of Washington's NIH-funded Child Health Equity Research Fellowship. She currently serves as the chair for the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's Committee on Addressing the Long-Term Impact of the COVID-19 Pandemic on Children and Families. And so with that, I um, welcome Dr. Coker and um, am so excited to hear her talk. Well, good uh, afternoon. I, I had to think about it a little bit because I'm actually not at home in Seattle right now. I'm on the road for a meeting in Toronto. Um, so I'm trying to keep time straight here. Uh, but I think I got the hang of it. Um, thank you for having me and I am just gonna move some stuff around on my screen so I can see the slides. Can you, you all see the slides okay? Can you see my slides? Yeah? Okay. Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, well, let's get started. Um, uh, I have nothing to disclose. Um, in the, um, objectives for this hour, I suppose we're already um, up on the slide before, but I'll go through um, just the agenda and kind of some objectives. We'll talk about why the disparities for ADHD care um, among Black children matter. Uh, what can we do to reduce those disparities, um, which will lead us to improving equity? And then what do we know specifically about the disparities and what other factors are um, leading or adding to this inequity in care that we have for ADHD for Black children. So I'm going to start off with the first learning objective, um, which is to evaluate how disparities, uh, when compounded with structural racism, um, impact the health and long-term well-being of uh, Black children with ADHD. So I, I we'll start here. Um, and this uh, is the problem we all live with. And that's the title of this well-known Norman Rockwell painting, which you may have seen before. It shows Ruby Bridges, who's the first black child to attend an all white elementary school in the South. And here in this um, uh, painting, she is walking into a newly desegregated school under the protection of four US Marshals. Now, over 40 years later, that image is reimagined and here we see a black child in a school surrounded by police officers. And here they have a different role than in the previous um, painting. Here, they're not a protective force, right? But they feel more imposing um, as an imposing force, um, bringing in policing into schools. And um, I show this to 
give us some background to talk through the idea of the school to prison pipeline. So the school to prison pipeline, which I imagine most uh, people on this screen are familiar with, describes a process in which harsh disciplinary policies at schools can lead um, us to push children out of the educational system into the juvenile justice system. And these overly harsh discipline uh, policies are things like out of school suspensions and expulsions. Um, these are harsh discipline of behavioral concerns um, that children might have at school and started with strict enforcement of zero tolerance policies, but really has continued um, even though many of those policies have changed. Uh, they often use things like suspension and expulsion, which I uh, talked about, a use of school resource officers and even law enforcement for children who have problem behaviors at school. One example is that you may have a child who is um, doing something uh, such as talking back to a teacher, or displaying some impulsive behaviors. And that can be interpreted by that teacher or someone in the school as an administrator as um, intimidation from that child to the teacher leading to criminalization of really a child behavior that otherwise would have maybe led to something like a trip to the principal's office or detention at recess. But instead, these behaviors are often approached with these harsh disciplinary procedures like school suspensions, um, sometimes expulsions, and um, they may even lead to things like police arrest. And we have ample data from around the country that uh, shows that black students are more likely to be placed in this school to prison pipeline um, through these harsh disciplinary procedures. So black children are disproportionately impacted by school suspension that is way out of their proportion to their numbers in the school system. They're suspended and expelled three times more often um, than white students. And when they are suspended or expelled for behavior, um, there's more a greater likelihood that they'll be in touch with the juvenile justice system um, in the following year. So there are certain populations who may be even more at risk. Um, black boys are three times more likely to be suspended um, than white boys. But when we look at girls, black girls are six times more likely and uh, with some data to be suspended than white girls. This graph here, um, is from a report from the Center for American Progress. And that's from 2018. And it shows the prevalence of suspensions and expulsions among children ages three to five. So now we're talking about preschool um, harsh discipline. And it shows the disproportionate use of suspensions and expulsions um, specifically for children with disabilities. Uh, and so just again, uh, it is preschool suspensions, which sounds ridiculous, but it is a true thing. Um, and so if we look at the table here, you can see in blue, um, that's the share of those children of the preschool population. And then the bars in orange are the share of the preschool suspensions and expulsion that that particular group has. So if you just look at, let's say um, the children here who have behavioral problems, they may make up 4% of, the, pre of um, uh, the preschool population, but they're 71% of the children who are uh, having to undergo uh, suspensions and expulsions. And ADHD, 2% of the preschool population, but a whopping 53% of the population who are being suspended and expulsion at a preschool level. Um, and, and so one of the things I just wanna point out here is that at this early age, it's um, even more problematic perhaps than you know, older school age children. Um, these are the children who are experiencing um, multiple, uh, they're the, high, the highest risk kids, right? So those who are black, low income with disabilities are also the children more likely to experience uh, multiple adverse childhood experiences, which may be manifesting as these behavioral problems in and of themselves. So rather than helping the children, um, giving them this harsh discipline is, um, uh, is quite disturbing. 
So this is a um, uh, from a report um, uh, that the Seattle Times came out with um, um, in, in my neck of the uh, uh, neighborhood, really to look at what are children getting suspended for, and the data is is from back in 2013 to 14 school year. But I I like this particular table because it just it does a nice. Um, job of breaking down what's happening because oftentimes we hear that there's um, the suspensions and expulsions, harsh discipline for children um, that, uh, but we don't know why or what that looks like. So here what they've done is uh, you can see the number of students suspended in that school year for different behaviors. So like let's say we just go down and look at the third row down, which is a disruptive conduct. Um, so here, 87 students total were suspended in that school year, um, and 52% of them are black, and but just 24% of them were white. Um, when we look at something like um, disobedience, um, 16 students suspended. Um, we got 44% um, African American versus 25% white. Um, interfering with school authority, 50% black, 6% white. So obviously these are not the, they are not as out of proportion um, to um, uh, black children and white children um, in the school system, um, but it's really showing that the same behaviors um, for children, um, those who are black are being treated quite differently. Uh, so, you know, you might think, well, suspension is just kind of a, a day out and maybe, you know, the disparity is not fair, but um, what are the consequences of those disparities? And so they have serious consequences. Um, depending on the, the data that you look at, you can have different numbers and what those consequences are, but um, largely um, it is thought that, uh, or data shows that out of school suspensions have consequences in terms of um, Things like uh, nearly half of high school students who have three or more suspensions will drop out of school before graduation. Those who are suspended or expelled are three times more likely to be in contact with the juvenile justice system in the following year. There's uh, a study came out, let's see, um, this is 2019, it was published. And what they did is um, the researchers used a long scan a longitudinal study that had children, um, 837 across five US cities and followed them from age four through 18. And of those um, uh, children, they looked at, uh, they, they wanted to find out um, whether or not there was a link between uh, suspension and later juvenile justice system involvement. And what they found was that children who were suspended by age 12, um, so just one suspension by age 12 were more likely to report uh, justice system involvement by age 18. 18 compared to those who had not, never been suspended. So there are serious consequences. Um, and, you know, this is not a talk about the juvenile justice system, but because we're talking about the school to prison pipeline and the preschool to prison pipeline, it's important to realize, um, you know, what our juvenile justice system in the United States looks like. And so, uh, although Black children comprise just 16% of the youth population, they uh, represents 58% of youth um, admitted to state prisons. So there are clear um, racial inequities um, in the juvenile justice system that lead to our, our justice system inequities. So, you know, we talked about the behaviors that children will have in school and how black children, their behaviors, um, are, are resulting um, in many cases in harsh discipline in far at far out of proportion um, to their numbers in the school compared to white children. And so many of these behaviors we'll get into a little bit are going to be behaviors that we see in children who have symptoms of ADHD um, and many who have a diagnosis of ADHD as well. So um, given this school to prison pipeline, what does the uh, proportion of children who are in the justice system look like? Uh, there was a meta-analysis um, uh, done to answer this particular question. Um, and they were able to uh, look at se several studies that um, used things like screening, 
and um, diagnostic interview uh, to look at the proportion of children in, in, in juvenile justice um, uh, incarcerated, both in uh, juvenile and adult, um, in the rates of ADHD. And although it's variable, uh, it's out of proportion to what we would expect based on our population level prevalence of ADHD. So 30% in juvenile incarcerated populations was an estimate from this review, uh, a meta-analysis and 34% in adult incarcerated populations. So I wanna talk for a few minutes about this uh, really interesting paper that kind of addresses this school to prison pipelines, particularly for children with ADHD symptoms. And so um, um, Binkin and colleagues wrote this paper um, uh, that attempted to link early ADHD symptoms uh, to adolescent and early adult outcomes in Black youth. And so they were interested specifically in answering a question, can ADHD symptoms lead to adult incarceration among Black youth? And so this is um, a little bit about how they hypothesized um, the, the model that they looked at for the school to prison pipeline. And so it could be in that the ADHD symptoms as we discussed are then interpreted as behavioral problems in school. Those behavioral problems in school coming from a black child are then associated with um, negative teacher ratings, low standardized test scores, um, and um, uh, exclusionary discipline and um, leading to juvenile arrest. Then those, that exclusionary discipline and juvenile arrest then leads to arrest in adulthood. So that is the um, hypothesized kind of way that we go from ADHD symptoms uh, to adult arrest. So to test the school to prison pipeline, um, they used a sample of 889 children who were participating in a longitudinal study of black families in Iowa and Georgia. And so subsample of that was used for this particular analysis. Children were um, ages 10 to 12 when they enrolled in the study. Uh, the baseline co data collection was back in 1997 to 98, and they continued to follow those children through 2008. Uh, collecting data on youth and their families and school data as well. They use a diagnostic interview schedule for children um, for, uh, to determine the ADHD symptoms at ages 10 to 12. They got teacher um, uh, data from the child behavior checklist form, state test scores were collected, and then in adulthood, they collected data on adult arrest and post, post high school education. So here we can see their hypothesized um, model for the school to prison pipeline for these children. And the correlation um, indicates the association for each step in the model. And so the short story is that the, the findings um, were consistent with their hypothesis of the school to prison pipeline starting with um, ADHD symptoms. Um, and so a diagnosis of ADHD um, in childhood uh, predicted uh, worse teacher ratings of that child's behavioral problems, um, which led to more exclusionary disciplinary actions and juvenile arrest, um, uh, which then uh, uh, was related to adult arrest. So um, this is a, a really kind of nice illustration of um, using data to show that school to prison pipeline specifically focused on children who have symptoms of ADHD in childhood. So that's, uh, I think, the, the, drop, the, um, the backdrop for why it really matters that we have disparities in ADHD diagnosis and treatment and care. Um, and those are real consequences that children will face starting in school. Um, which can lead to consequences throughout their lifetime. So what are the ways that we can address um, these disparities in care, which lead to these um, huge inequities? And so to um, talk about this, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and focus specifically on how we provide um, um, parenting training and behavioral um, uh, parenting training to families. 
uh, specifically to meet the needs of Black families who have children with ADHD. Uh, so before I do that, I like to, uh, I, I'm a general pediatrician, that wasn't clear. Um, and so I always have to kind of found, um, ground myself in the foundational research around ADHD because, um, you know, it's something I came to later and uh, not um, trained as a general pediatrician um, in psychiatry. So I like to go back to just look at the multimodal um, treatment study of children with ADHD as a way to set the stage to think about um, why we need these particular um, interventions for families. So uh, this started as a randomized trial of 579 children ages seven to nine randomized to four groups, um, receiving 14 months of medication management, um, intensive behavioral treatment, combination of medication and behavioral treatment or community routine community care. And so the primary results were published back in 1999, um, but since the trial, there's been numerous follow-up studies and analyses to define really what we know about treating ADHD. So in an analysis of the data um, back in published in 2003, um, Arnold and colleagues looked at what are the effects of race ethnicity um, having on treatment outcomes at that 14 month outcome um, that was looked at. And so to do this, they matched each African American family in the study um, with a white participant by gender, um, treatment assignment group uh, and site to understand whether and how treatment differed by child, race, and ethnicity. And so what they found were three main things. First, the response to methylphenidate was not different um, by race and ethnicity. Uh, they found, second, that adding behavioral treatment was likely um, an important factor for children in low socioeconomic status environments and households, particularly for children who are both, who are Black or um, Latinx. And then parent and teacher ratings of symptoms, this is the, the third main finding I wanna point out, often don't match as well for black children or Latin, uh, Latino children, Latino children as they do for white children. So really emphasizing that the, um, although we know how important medication management is for children with ADHD, that adding some behavioral treatment for combination therapy, uh, specifically for those in low SES households was really important. Uh, so that is the kind of this, ensuring that children have a high quality treatment program, including medication and behavioral treatment is gonna be better for outcomes um, based on the households that are uh, children who are um, where they are coming from and the importance for black children was clear. So I wanna focus on parenting training for a moment. Um, in many cases, behavioral parenting training is provided through these evidence-based programs like Triple P or Incredible Years and often in groups of parents um, led by a, a mental health care or behavioral health care uh, professional. The programs can be anywhere from eight to 10 sessions long. And in primary care, when we see a child who has ADHD, you know, we can provide diagnosis, um, we can initiate medication, and we can manage the medication for children with ADHD, and we should be as primary care um, providers. But where we can't do as much right in primary care is this element of behavioral um, treatment for families. Um, most of the times, um, this type of, you know, multi-session parent training um, can be provided in hospital-based um, clinics, can be provided um, more so in um, mental health clinics, um, but there are a few resources to do this right in the primary care setting. So there is a wide range of accessibility uh, for families. And even when we find one getting access um, is for the parent, it's themselves may be difficult. Uh, and then the other piece is who is the parenting training provided uh, excuse me, designed for, and is that going to be culturally relevant to meet the needs of Black families? So when we think about um, parenting training, 
I, I do feel like we have to kind of go back to just think about what are the really classic parenting styles that have been broadly defined. Um, and, and they do differ uh, uh, amongst families uh, by race and ethnicity. And while um, we may not subscribe to exactly how they were initially um, defined, they do serve as an important backdrop to a discussion about um, accessibility and culturally relevant parenting training for Black families. So there's an authoritarian parenting style where parents have high behavioral expectations, utilize more punitive disciplinary strategies. The permissive parenting style, parents have fewer demands or behavioral expectations and um, or limits um, and restrictions on children. And then there's the authoritative um, style, which has been defined as really a balance between authoritarian and permissive. Um, and uh, balancing appropriate behavioral expectations with responses, responsiveness to the child. So researchers over the years have found that on average, black families are more likely than white to use an authoritarian style. And the general conclusion in the literature is that the authoritative style is most effective form of parenting in terms of having positive child outcomes. Um, although there's some data from African-American families that may challenge that assumption. Uh, so most of the parenting training for ADHD really focuses on the strategies that emphasize this authoritative parenting style, labeled praise for compliant behavior, um, non-physical discipline um, strategies for non-compliance, and then really being able to ignore negative behavior and focus on the positive. Uh, so how can we provide this type of evidence-based behavioral parenting training for Black families? that fit the historical, um, social, political context of what it means to parent a Black child in the United States. Um, and I'm gonna talk very quickly about these three main areas I, that um, of focus. So first is understanding the context of parenting for Black families, then being able to adjust the content of our training for Black families and adapting the format to meet their needs. So understanding the context, <clears throat> um, we have to come to parents with an understanding of what is the context of parenting uh, black in, in, in Black families. And so this historical context starts for African-American families in slavery, goes through Jim Crow, through the civil rights movement, all the way up to the present day. And through that history, um, Black parents have been faced with challenging the challenges of preparing their Black children to endure racism um, and unfair treatment in our society. And I will uh, talk to about this, this within that, um, facing the demands um, of having complete compliance for Black children, um, which clearly for children who have ADHD is, 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 is not doable, right? And that's really what we, um, focus on in parenting training. So uh, during slavery, <clears throat> children made up a substantial proportion of Africans who were forced into slavery and brought to the US. Before 1865, um, the estimates were about 12.5 million Africans were brought to the um, New World on ships. Nearly a quarter were children. And, Children were defined in US slave industry as a person under the height of 4-4, so not an age-related um, definition. The average African who was uh, stolen into slave trade was a teen to a young adult in the, during the, um, uh, the beginning. But as the Emancipation Proclamation um, came closer to pass, um, younger and younger Africans were forced into slavery and brought to the US. And by the time it was clear that the abolition of the slave trade was imminent, the average age of the African stolen into slavery and brought to the US went down to an age of nine to 12 years old um, is a, an estimate. So in the US slave trade, slaves were of course not allowed um, to maintain any other culture. And so the parenting practices of West African cultures were lost. Children as slaves were just a, were a commodity, right? Like any other slave in the, um, 
in, in the industry. They were subjugated to all the horrors of slavery that we know, including brutal violence, um, separation of families, sexual assault and rape. Parents who were slaves had no authority over their own children. And in many cases, they had to um, watch them endure uh, uh, these types of horrors of slavery and abuse from owners, from overseers. Um, they um, often had to suffer um, seeing their children sold away or perhaps the parents were sold away themselves. So here are some photos from the Smithsonian National Museum of African-American History and Culture. On the top, you see a photo of women and children in the cotton fields in the 1860s. Below that is a photo that you may have seen before um, called Gordon under medical inspection. This was a um, photograph of an escaped slave and, and it's famous in that it fueled the abolitionist movement. And to the right, um, we see a photo oops, of iron shackles that were specifically made to fit a child. So when slavery ended, uh, the injustices that children endured did not. Um, African-American families continued the need to teach their children how to show complete reverence and compliance to white people in public because any deviation in that um, could be perceived um, uh, as, by white people as, um, uh, as a slight and um, leading to severe consequences for black children. So here on the top, you see photos, um, the photo on the top, excuse me, let's see, uh, is from also the Smithsonian National Museum of African-American History and Culture. And it shows the struggle. Black children at the top are standing outside of the Arkansas school, um, awaiting instructions from a teacher to register for school as uh, desegregation occurred in the schools. And you can see here, um, yeah, the black children are standing against the wall um, waiting for that instruction. Uh, white children are in the forefront, kind of milling around, much more relaxed. On the picture below, that is Emmett Till and his mother. Uh, and um, I imagine you know the story of Emmett Till, but just in case you don't, um, he was lynched in Mississippi in 1955 at the age of 14. Um, and uh, he lived in Chicago um, with his family and um, went to Mississippi for the summer to stay with family. Uh, and while he was visiting his family in Mississippi, um, went to the store with his cousins and some friends to get some candy. He was in the store, a white woman in the store accused him of wolf whistling at her, um, which she later, years and years later, um, uh, admitted that she lied about. Um, but because of that perceived slight of whistling, um, he was um, kidnapped, brutally beaten and murdered. Um, and so his mother um, courageously uh, had his mutilated body displayed for the world to see uh, in an open casket funeral in Chicago, which really sparked the next phase of the civil rights movement at the time. An, an all white jury, by the way, acquitted his, um, the white men who killed him um, of his murder. And then here um, on the right of the screen is a pamphlet that's published um, from the International Labor Defense. And it shows a photograph of men marching in support of the Scottsboro Boys. And that is the story of nine black teenagers, ages 13 to 20, who are falsely accused in Alabama of raping two white women in 1931. And the case was heard in Scottsboro, Alabama, uh, but also included a lynch mob. So these are the, um, it's just a couple of the, probably thousands of stories um, of what happens when black children um, in that did not have uh, complete compliance with whatever it was that um, white people expected them to do in public. So starting in slavery to Jim Crow to today, black parents have had to teach their children to deal with the brutal realities of racism that are going to impact them. And so, um, 
the this authoritarian style that has been um, reported in the literature amongst more commonly amongst Black families um, was not a choice, um, but ra rather a, a matter of living or dying. And so this need um, for Black families to instill complete uh, compliance in the face of white authority has persisted. So <clears throat> here I show um, just a few of the Black children who have been killed by police officers. Uh, and I'll stop, start from the top row, left to right. Um, at the top, we have Kwame K.K. Jones, who was 17, shot in 2020 during a traffic stop by police. Kendrick McDade, age 19, was shot dead by police officers in Pasadena, California in 2012. Uh, the officers were looking for a thief who stole a backpack and um, Kendrick was not the thief, but was killed. Tamir Rice, who most of you have heard of, I am sure, was 12 years old, killed by a police officer in 2014, um, caught on video. He was at a park playing with a toy gun that had an orange tip barrel. A woman across the street saw him, called the police, complaining that a black man um, was at the park with a gun and the police drove up and shot him immediately. Jordan Edwards is a 15 year old who was shot by a police officer in 2017. Um, he was leaving a high school party with his three brothers and uh, his older brother was driving the car. Laquan McDonald was 17 and shot by the police in 2014. Devon Bailey, age 19, shot in the back by police in 2019. Cameron Tillman was 14. He was a high school freshman and was shot by the police while hanging out with uh, friends after school. They, um, in their neighborhood, there was a home, empty house that um, the kids used as an after school hangout. And when, with the owner's permission, the police were called um, for a disturbance, knocked on the door, Cameron opened it and he was shot immediately. And then here on the bottom right is uh, Detrick Griffin, 18, shot by police in 2019. So it, we have to come to parents with a clear understanding, I think as providers, when we are um, talking about behavioral parenting training or ADHD um, behaviors that children have in school and the consequences they may face of those behaviors in school or in public, um, have a clear understanding of what is a historical context because I can that is what is in the parent's mind as well even if it is not said in that room with the provider so having a clear understanding of this historical context around black parenting um, and, and I say historical context but it really is also a um, current context and this can be done in several ways um, so showing exa examples and scenarios um, that uh, depict Black families um, in some of these uh, uh, training videos. I um, did the training myself. I did, I think it was incredible years and I have two children who have ADHD and my husband and I took it. I was already in uh, uh, practice as a pediatrician, um, but a lot of the things that you know intellectually you need to understand emotionally, right? And that's what the training is about. Um, and there, all the examples, you know, were generally of white families um, doing the techniques. Uh, but there was one video that showed a black mother um, uh, being able to ignore the behavior that she didn't and, and highlight the behavior that she wanted in that child. And even just for me seeing that was like an aha moment, like, ah, that's a doable kind of thing that I could do in my own life. So um, realizing that Black families often don't have that ability to see themselves in the examples that we give uh, versus white families are going to have that, um, including things like racial socialization and how coping with racism as part of training, I think helps families understand that we are coming to the table with an understanding of what they're up against as Black parents. Adapting the format, you know, we ask families to come in for this type of training. Um, in the evening, six to eight sessions, sometimes 12 sessions. Um, and oftentimes there are a lot of stressors in people's lives that make that um, difficult to do. So particularly during the pandemic, I think we've seen um, 
um, multiple ways that we can use telehealth and mobile options for care uh, and what we need to do also to ensure that 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 technology does not widen existing disparities. Um, so those are different formats, including um, non-clinical providers, maybe non-licensed professionals like community health workers who have lived experience with families in that um, in that interaction, in that teaching, to be able to allow families to get the, uh, the content um, in a more culturally appropriate way from individuals who have shared lived experiences. And then I wanna spend about um, 10 minutes just going through the disparities um, and, and then I'll wrap up and we'll have some time for questions. So there's a, nice uh, review um, of the disparities in for ADHD for black children in diagnosis and medication treatment. Um, and that came out in you know, just 2022. So it's a there's a lot of literature around this area. And sometimes it's hard to keep track um, of what is happening. But this study did a nice job of just showing where where the disparities are and where um, there are some questions. So they looked at um, disparities in diagnosis. I'll start there first, focusing on black versus white children. They found 21 studies that were reporting, um, uh, you could think of it as a reported diagnosis of ADHD or just a diagnostic prevalence of ADHD in the sample of black and white children. Um, so of those 21 studies, 14, that's that green kind of half circle, um, there was a statistically significant difference in that black children were less likely than white children to have a diagnosis in ADHD. Um, and five studies found no difference. And then two studies found um, just the opposite that black children were more likely than white children to have a diagnosis of ADHD. These are what the studies look like. Um, I've included some of them here in the boxes with the citations below. And in the boxes, you can see where the studies got their samples from. So these all showed lower rates of diagnosis for black compared with white children. There's studies from the National Survey of Children Health, Children's Health, which you may be familiar with, um, National Health Interview Survey, the Medical Expenditures Panel Survey, Early Childhood Longitudinal Survey, both the kindergarten and the birth cohort. Um, there's a national health um, in Haines and then the national comorbidity survey. Um, studies that are not on the national level, but are across multiple uh, states or in one particular jurisdiction, healthy passages um, uh, is across um, multiple states. Um, there's uh, studies that are just more localities like in Wisconsin, South Carolina, Kentucky, and then California all of these showing lower rates of diagnosis for black compared with white children. These are the, um, some of the studies, the five studies that um, had no difference in the, in the data um, between black and white children for um, diagnosis. And then there were two that showed the, the flip, right? And so these samples um, are a little bit different, uh, New York public, uh, mental health system survey, which may have a more biased sample of children. And then the National Survey of Children's Health, which in previous years had shown a disparity in diagnosis, but in this is the most recent one where their um, data collection was redesigned and um, that it's um, no longer used a phone methodology to receive, to get parents. And so the idea is that it's possible that the sample is a little bit different, but also the systematic review shows that over time, um, in more recent data, there may be um, a narrowing um, of that difference. The disparities in medication quickly, there were 23 studies that looked at this in the systematic review. 15 found that black children were less likely than white to receive a medication or be taking a medication for ADHD. Eight studies found no statistically significant differences, although some did find a trend. And then there were no studies that showed the opposite, that black children were more likely than white to have an, um, a medication. I won't go through all of these, but many of the national studies are actually the same because they have data both on diagnosis and medication.
And um, these are, again, either the multi-state or local studies that um, also show lower rates of medication for Black compared with white children. Some of these are from same, the same samples that use diagnosis. Um, and again, there were, there were no studies that showed the opposite. So the large volume of literature shows us that um, Black children are less likely to be diagnosed in most studies, the majority of studies, and less likely to receive medication. And so the root of why that occurs, um, it, it at most all the reasons that, that have been hypothesized, they all come back down to structural racism. Um, and just a couple of um, few more slides before we go to a little bit discussion. I want to um, point out that I think can highlight that and show a little bit of, of what these families are up against. So there was a recent systematic review, 46 studies to look at, okay, what's the longitudinal relationship between children experiencing racial discrimination and their, and their health outcomes? And so this, um, over these studies, um, the conclusion was that there was a significant, statistically significant association between um, perceived racial discrimination um, with mental health outcomes, particularly around behavioral problems, including delinquency, um, high-risk behaviors, and other mental health um, outcomes of interest. So the other piece is when a family is making that shared decision around medication and treatment and diagnosis with a, their provider or their provider team, um, there right needs to be some element of relationship and, and built trust um, to be able to come to that. Um, there's lots of data that show that black parents and black adults, um, parents or not, have less um, are, are less likely to trust their providers um, compared with white families. And that lack of trust is really rooted um, in structural racism and their experiences of racial discrimination, not only with providers in the healthcare system, but in our society in general. Uh, and the other piece is that um, trust is low amongst adults, um, particularly in settings that have low provider continuity. So that speaks to the relationship um, that families have with their provider as well. And then finally, treatment engagement, right? So you can combine all these things that the experiences of racial discrimination, um, historical reasons for not having trust and, 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 and built relationships with providers um, ahead of getting that diagnosis of ADHD and the recommendations for treatment. So we know that um, in addition to black children being less likely to receive treatment, they're also less likely, they're also more likely to discontinue um, medication once they start and to disengage from treatment. Uh, and th that may be related to that lack of trusting relationships, um, kind of that background of racism that even starts um, before you walk into the room and get your diagnosis and what's gonna happen after that. There's a, a recent qualitative study that uh, looked at what are the stages that families go through um, as they get that diagnosis of ADHD and treatment. And so the stage, stages of engagement for ADHD care and really broke it down into six stages that families go through. So it seems um, unlikely that, I, that with all this background of what families are coming to, we cannot do everything in one or two visits, right? It's gonna take time to um, get families um, through that, um, walk through them with those stages of engagement um, to get the best ADHD care that we can. So this is my final slide and it's um, just wanna kind of wrap up to um, emphasize the potential impact that the disparities that we have seen in the literature have um, in ADHD care have on our um, black children and families. So we start off here at the top of this funnel with the behavioral and mental health problems um, like symptoms of ADHD. These are exacerbated um, in, in, a, in a context of racism, um, structural racism, poverty, and all the related stressors um, and, uh, that families have based on that. Then once children have those di this, um, the di symptoms and diagnosis, in addition to all that, um, 
the exacerbation um, of life and stressors in it, which can prevent even parents or diminish parents' ability to deal with them, then they receive inadequate intervention for ADHD once they are diagnosed. Um, and this is related to the things we talked about, disparities in di not only diagnosis and treatment, but the relationship, trust, poor access to care. And so they have symptoms, maybe diagnosis, maybe not, inadequate um, intervention um, due to reasons related to structural racism. And then in schools, those that ADHD, particularly when it's untreated or un not fully addressed, uh, is going to have a differential um, interpretation and consequences for Black children compared with white. And those consequences can be severe. And as we discussed, um, uh, lead to the school to prison pipeline. So I am going to stop here. And um, stop sharing and, and open it up for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Coker, for this very important talk. Um, we have some time left over for questions from the audience. If you could unmute yourself and uh, state your question, that would be great. Alternatively, you could type in the chat and I will read it out um, if that would um, be a better format for folks. I have a quick question, that's okay. Um, first of all, thank you for that really informative and important talk. I'm wondering about the, the role of um, uh, comorbidities like diagnoses of ODD, conduct disorder, and how that also plays into the, um, the pipeline and kind of harsh, more harsh treatment and yeah, that's, that's been kind of factored into some of the, um, some yeah. of the studies that you talked about. Yeah, no, that's great. There have been some studies um, that have shown that black children are more likely to receive a diagnosis of conduct disorder and ODD rather than ADHD. Um, and, and white children are more likely to receive a diagnosis of ADHD for the same level of symptoms. Um, so, you know, I think that's kind of one under, it's just another disparity that I didn't get a chance to um, discuss. Um, but that obviously is gonna, you know, once you're diagnosed with conduct disorder and, and ODD, it's quite different than being diagnosed with ADHD um, to, to have that. And, um, you know, the, the, those consequences, I, I think you could, the relationship with the school to prison pipeline is going to be um, the same or worse for those those children who are are, are not receiving the right diagnosis. Um, and again, that th that highlights the the um, contribution, I think, of provider bias um, as well um, uh, in children. So, yeah, I think particularly those diagnoses are. Um, can be problematic um, for kids in the school system. And I think uh, in particular, when teachers see that, there's just gonna be you know, a different level of, of interaction that they're gonna have with those children, even with the same behaviors um, that if it was called ADHD, then they're gonna have. Yeah, that labeling, I think can just be so pernicious for, for some of these kids, so. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Other questions? Well, I, I have one. Dr. Coger, what do you think um, would be your top recommendations for mental health clinicians um, who are working you know, with their um, uh, primary care provider um, colleagues in ad you know, addressing some of these issues that you've raised today? Yeah, I think... Um really the context question is really important for families. So by the time they come to mental health professionals, right, that someone's already recognized that there's a problem, right? So from primary care, we're really, um, uh, I believe our, our role is to identify those kids and to um, 
you know, make that identification. But by the time they get to the mental health professional that has at least been identified that there is some problem. And so in that discussion with families, that trust is really important in that relationship. And so it is, is it might be difficult um, to have those conversations about race and what the parents' concerns are about racism in the school system or how the diagnosis is gonna impact the child, um, whether they see that as a label that's gonna be negative um, in the school system or in their lives. Um, but to have that discussion, I think with families at least helps that family understand that their provider has some understanding of the context in which they parent um, rather than not saying anything about it because it's uncomfortable to talk about race. Um, um, in a racially dis discordant um, provider parent relationship or even concordant. Um, so I, th I think my top recommendation would be addressing it early on to find out what are the parents' concerns because if you don't know, then there may be some um, that that miscommunication is, is, you know, can kind of block that, I think, therapeutic relationship that's so important for families to have with their mental health care professional team. Um, and then I guess one other thing is in terms of treatment, um, both behavioral um, and medication is, you know, there is, I think, some the literature, if you think about uh, around disparities in ADHD, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago was really when there was a disparity and particularly diagnosis or medication, the discussion was really about patient preference, right? And um, um, the black families didn't want medication or had a different view of the symptoms um, and so forth. But I think understanding that the, that hesitancy to use medication, to um, accept the diagnosis um, is a function of structural racism. And I think we were able to see that during COVID, the pandemic with vaccination, you know, so-called hesitancy, but just a low confidence in the system, right? And so I think if we can take that view um, that it's not necessarily like a patient preference thing. It really is a, a byproduct of our of our system of racism in this country. Um, then that conversation it can become a little bit more fruitful over time in, in medication and management for the child. Well, thank you, Dr. Coker. We are unfortunately out of time now, and so I just want to give you a round of applause virtually. Um, and thank you again for this excellent and very important talk today. And thank okay. you all for attending. There, uh, the link for the um, CME credit has been placed in the chat. Um, if you will be claiming that, please do that, um, fill out that form. And thank you again for attending Grand Rounds today. Thank you for having me.